<clears throat> All right, well, if you could take your Bibles and open them to Genesis chapter 9 and verse 18. The title of our message this morning is The Preservation of the Saints. As you guys can see, I brought my props in with me today. This is for VBS, by the way, um, which is a good advertisement if you're in the Houston area and you haven't signed your kids up for VBS. I think you can still do that um, on our website. And I was sort of looking at all this stuff. I was thinking I could develop a sermon just from these things up here. So you've got the water down there. Well, that's the water of life. And then there's a fish over here. Jesus said, you know, make fishers of men. And then there's a lion over there. My wife said he's lying down on the job. <laughs> but, you know, the lion and lamb, there we go. And there's a bird here. Uh, what can we do with the bird? Um, you're going to soar like eagles, right? Doesn't it say that? Not grow weary. And then I don't know what to do with the train, though. I was thinking maybe train up a child in the way he shall go. But I... <laughs> All right, well, that's the sermon today. Let's close in prayer. Well, as you know, we're studying the book of Genesis, and we are into the first half of the book, or first part of it, the beginning of the human race. And we've seen creation, God's original design for our world before things went awry. Genesis 1 and 2, then came Genesis 3 through 5, the fall. And yet there's hope of a coming Redeemer to correct things to God's original intention. First outlined for us or prophesied in probably the very first prophecy of the Bible Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Keep your eye on that one because that's going to come up today. Then we got into the flood, chapters 6 through 9, events before the flood, chapter 6, the flood itself, chapter 7, the abating on the, of the waters, chapter 8, and then the events following the flood. We are in the middle of studying events subsequent to or following the flood. And there's two major events that happen. Number one, God's covenant with Noah. That starts in Genesis 8, verse 20, and goes all the way through chapter 9, verse 17. And if memory serves, we completed that material last week. And now we move into the second major event in the post-flood world, which is post-flood sin. Here is an outline of post-flood sin, which will take us to the end of the chapter. Number one, Noah's sin, verses 18 through 21. Number two, the sin of Ham, Noah's son, and the curse that was pronounced on Noah's, excuse me, Ham's fourth son, Canaan. And that's in verses 22 through 27. And that is going to require some effort because of an abuse that has been used of those verses to justify racism. And then finally, verses 28 and 29 is Noah's death. And so that is where we're moving. I don't think we can cover all this today, but let's see how far we can get. Number one, Noah's sin. And this is where we learn that Noah is not the Savior or the Messiah we might have thought he was. You'll notice there Genesis chapter 9, and look, if you will, at verse 18. It says, now the sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And then it says, and Ham was the father of Canaan. You'll notice there in verse 18 the word ark. So this is connecting us with what has already happened concerning the events of the flood, which we've studied in depth. We're now in the post 
flood world, there's a transition. And you'll notice also there's three sons of Noah that are mentioned. Number one, Shem. Number two, Ham. Number three, Japheth. I think that's the birth order. There's a little ambiguity when we get down to verse 24, which I'll try to correct, but I think it's safe to say that the birth order is Shem is the oldest, Ham is the middle child, and Japheth is Noah's youngest. If you're into taking notes and want other verses on this, here's a few verses that give you the same order. Genesis 5, verse 32, Genesis 6, verse 10, Genesis 7, verse 13, Genesis 10, verse 1, and also in 1 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 4. Genesis 5, 32, Genesis 6, 10, I feel like a used car salesman here. Genesis 7, verse 13, Genesis 10, verse 1, 1 Chronicles chapter 1, verse Verse 4. If you didn't get it that second time through, that's why God invented audio archives. Amen. You'll also notice there in verse 18 that it talks about how Ham was the father of uh, Canaan. Ham had uh, four sons. You'll see Ham's four sons mentioned in Genesis 10, verse 6. They are Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. So Canaan was the fourth son of Ham. And that's very important to understand because of an abuse of Genesis 9, verses 25 and following, where people essentially try to argue that the white race is justified in subjugating the black race. In fact, if you watch the movie Mississippi Burning about the Jim Crow South with uh, William Defoe, I think he was the actor, you'll notice that in the movie the southern racists used this chapter to justify racism and you can see right out of the gate that that's a warped interpretation. The curse was not placed on the black race. The curse was placed on the descendants of Noah's, excuse me, Ham's uh, fourth son, Canaan. And we learn why that curse is going to be placed on him. And it has nothing to do with genetics. And so if you're going to use Genesis 9 verse 25 to say that whites are superior to the blacks, number one, you've got the skin color wrong. Because Ham was probably not even black. He was probably Middle Eastern or olive skinned. And number two, you've got the continent wrong. You're dragging something into North America that concerns only the land of Israel, what then was called Canaan. A lot more we're going to say about that as we progress because the Bible teaches that there is one race the human race. Because what people say, and they can't wait for us to say something like this, that if you believe the Bible, you must be a racist. The opposite is true. The principles of the Bible have done more to eradicate racism than any other single book you can think of. And so that's why looking very carefully at this language here in verse 18 becomes very significant. Ham was the father of Canaan. The curse is going to fall on Canaan. Not all of Ham's descendants, but his fourth son. A lot more on that as we progress. But notice, uh, if you will, verse 19. It says, these were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was repopulated. That is true. From Shem, the oldest, came forth the Semitic people groups. Who are the people's Semitic groups? Assyrians, Babylonians, Persians, Arabs, and ultimately the Hebrews are going to come from that group. 
And there is going to be a blessing pronounced on that people group in verse 26, indicating that the Messiah is going to be from the descendants of Shem. From the word Shem, we get the word Semitic. And so we're going to know when we get to verse 26 that the Messiah, when he comes, is going to come from the Semitic people groups. And then the second born son is Ham. And Ham and his fourth son went into Canaan. And from Ham came the inhabitants of Africa. And then will come Japheth. Japheth, very interestingly, is going to be receptive to the things of God, particularly the prophecy given concerning Shem. Uh, the prophecy concerning Shem is going to be absorbed, as we will see, into the people groups of Japheth. And from Japheth will come the European nations, the North American continent, Asia, etc., so all of this, Genesis 9, is sort of a prelude to what's coming in Genesis 10, where we're going to learn where all of these people groups ultimately coming from these three sons settled. And there's a big discussion today about the Gog-Magog invasion in Ezekiel 38 and 39. I wrote a little book about this called The Middle East Meltdown, which we'll give it to you as a gift just for the asking, and I try to document who those players are in this coming Gog-Magog invasion. And the players can be identified by paying attention to where the people groups in Genesis 10, coming from Noah's three sons, settled. That's why I'm confident that, that Turkey is going to be an invader. Um, Persia or Iran is going to be an invader. Russia is going to be an invader because you're going to see all of those people groups in Ezekiel 38 and 39 first identified there in Genesis 10. But the fact of the matter is all of us owe our heritage to these three sons of Noah and their respective wives that repopulated the earth. Acts 17 verse 26 says he made from one man every nation of mankind. The one man is Adam. All of us are descendants of Adam. And then Adam's lineage is carefully traced, Genesis 5, from Adam to Noah and then to Noah's three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And all of us are in the lineage of one of those three Sons. So this relates to a biblical understanding of origins, where everything came from. Notice, if you will, verse 20. What did Noah do in the post-flood world? It says, Noah, verse 20, Genesis 9, began farming and planted a vineyard. Now, this word begun is interesting in Hebrew. I looked at a lot of different commentaries on this, and they say that begun means Noah took on a new occupation or a new profession, in this case farming, being a husbandman, I guess is how you say that, an occupation that he had in the post-flood world that he didn't have in the pre-flood world. A new profession, a new occupation, different now than it was before the flood. And most people will skip over this, but to me it's significant because it shows that God is a God of new beginnings. We're in a new world. The flood has cleansed the earth. The earth is being repopulated. And all of that communicates how God is doing something new, right down to giving Noah a new assignment, a new job. And I find these scriptures very interesting because if the Bible teaches anything, it teaches that God is a God of new beginnings. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 says of God, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, this person is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. There are so many people that live their lives looking in the rearview mirror, regretting something that happened to them in the past. 
But the truth of the matter is, Paul, who had a lot of regrets in his pre-Christian life and could have lingered in the past, keeps talking over and over again how he's not looking into the past, Philippians 3, but he's pressing forward under the prize. If we're always looking in the past, looking in our rearview mirror, then we're really living beneath who we are in Christ. Because whom the Son sets free is free indeed. We are new creations in Jesus Christ. And in fact, God is so good at at giving people a fresh start that he's actually going to take this whole world that's been contaminated by sin and he's going to destroy it by fire, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, and he's going to create a whole new world. Revelation 21, verse 1, John says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And in fact, this new beginning is something that relates to our regeneration. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, then on the promises of God's word, not only are you a new creation, but you have been regenerated. Something new is living on the inside of you that wasn't there before. It's spoken of in the book of Titus, chapter 3 and verse 5, which says, He saved us. Not on the basis of the deeds which, which we did in righteousness, but according, in accordance with his mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. What is regeneration? It's, it's the new birth. It literally means the impartation of divine life. Formerly, we were dead in our trespasses and sins, and then we trusted in Christ for salvation, and God flicked on the light switch, and the Holy Spirit entered you at the point of faith alone in Christ alone. That's called regeneration. Now, it's fascinating in the Greek. The Greek is translated regeneration in English. The Greek is Pauline Genesia which is two words making up a single word, a compound word. So you have to sort of break that word down into its parts to understand what it means. Number one, Pauline, that's just an adverb that means again. And then what book of the Bible do you recognize in that second part of the word, Genesia? Hint, we're studying it right now. The book of Genesis, which is the book of beginnings. And literally, that's what regeneration means. It means beginning again, beginning anew, a fresh start. It's a word that's used only one other time in the whole Greek New Testament. And you'll discover its use in Matthew 19, verse 28, concerning the kingdom. The kingdom is a regeneration when God brings it. It says in Matthew 19, verse 28, And he said to them, Truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration. That's our word, Pauline Genesia. When the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. What is the millennial kingdom? It's, it's a brand new start. It's beginning Again, what is the Christian? It's a new start. It's beginning again. And as the gospel is going to be given at the conclusion of this service, our hope and prayer is that many people will respond to it and start fresh with the Lord. Start, start again with the Lord. Start, start new with the Lord. This is God's specialty And this specialty is so good in terms of God's hand that Noah is beginning here in a brand new world with brand new meteorological conditions and he is given actually a brand new skill set which the Lord gave him. He became sort of a, a farmer of sorts, if you will. You know, there are so many times in family life you know, even in marriage, 
where the prior day things just didn't work out, you know, the way you wanted. Maybe there's a conflict with somebody, maybe there's a conflict with your spouse. And there are so many times the two of us, Anne and myself, will get up and we'll just say, let's just, let's just start over. Or sometimes, you know, we'll get midway through the day and things didn't, didn't go well. And we just, we just say, you know what, the past is the past. Uh, let's just pretend that we're waking up right now. And let's start over. Let's pretend like yesterday it didn't happen. Let's pretend like the past couple of hours <laughs> didn't happen. And I think we would get a lot further in terms of our human relationships if we just let the past be that, the past. All of us make errors and mistakes that we regret, but we need to understand at the end of the day that God wants a fresh start. That's who he is. That's his nature. The book of Lamentations, chapter 3, verses 22 and 23 says, The Lord's act of mercy indeed do not end, for his compassions do not fail. They are new every other morning. Whoops, doesn't say that. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And so Noah here gets a fresh start. But unfortunately, something goes wrong. Look at verse 21. He drank of the wine. Now, thus far, no problem. There's a lot of people that will put you on spiritual probation for consuming any alcohol under any circumstance. I know this is fighting words in some denominations, but the truth of the matter is I see no such prohibition in Scripture in fact, Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23, and says, Do not go on drinking only water, but use a little wine, notice it doesn't say a lot of wine, for the sake of your stomach and frequent ailments. I don't know if Paul would have passed a lot of doctrinal exams in a lot of denominations, because he says wine has some value, at least there. It has some, in this context, medicinal value. So, so far, so good. Noah, with this new skill set that God gave him, is planting a vineyard. He drank of the wine. No, no problem thus far. But what does it say here? And he became drunk and uncovered himself in his tent. Now we have a problem. The Bible does not condemn drinking but it does condemn drunkenness it condemns putting one's mind in an inebriated state held hostage so to speak to a foreign substance Ephesians 5 verse 18 says and do it's a command do not get drunk with wine in which there is debauchery but instead be filled with the Holy Spirit. In other words, don't allow yourself to be artificially controlled by a foreign substance that you put into your body. If you want to be controlled by a foreign substance, then let that be the Holy Spirit. Because when you're drunk, you do a lot of things that are unnatural. You're rude, crude, and lewd sometimes. You talk too loud. You say things you probably shouldn't say. You can hurt a lot of people's feelings being in that state. But isn't it interesting that when you're under the influence of the Holy Spirit, you do a lot of things you wouldn't do normally also? Like what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. The walk of the Spirit. If you want to be under the influence of something that leads you to do things that you normally wouldn't do, try the Holy Spirit, Paul says. Don't be drunk with wine. But Noah uh, obviously had gone too far and he became drunk and he uncovered himself. Now, it is interesting in the Bible that drunkenness is connected quite frequently to nakedness. 
the book of Lamentations chapter 4 and verse 21 says, you will become drunk and expose yourself. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 15 is very graphic. And it says this, woe to him who makes his neighbor to, uh, to drink. To you who mix in your venom, even to make your neighbors drunk, so you look, so as to look at their genitalia. There it is right there in the Bible. It, it leads to lewdness, it leads to uh, violation of God's sexual standards. You do a lot of things that you're ashamed of, that we are ashamed of when we are not inebriated. Anybody that grows up in the home of an alcoholic can readily testify to this. Tragically, in my own family, we had in my extended family someone that was um, an alcoholic. And this particular person, extended family I'm speaking of, would start his drinking at usually about 11 a.m. And as the late morning rolled into early afternoon, latter afternoon, early evening, he was obviously a different person. He was saying and doing things that he would have never done uh, prior to beginning his drinking at 11 a.m. This was a daily occurrence. It destroyed almost everything in his life. Right down to his marriage and to his health, he had to take an early exit, so to speak, died early because of this condition. Uh, We have to monitor very carefully our freedoms in Christ and make sure they're not being used as tools of Satan to put us into incarceration, spiritually speaking. And somehow Noah allowed that to happen to himself. Now, when you study the Bible, one of the things to pay attention to is not just the what question. Most people can answer the what question, what happened. But once you understand the what question, you have to take it to the next level and you have to ask yourself the why question. I mean, why would this story be included? Of all of the things that Moses could have talked about when he compiled this work that we call the book of Genesis, why in the world would he insert this story that he could have left out entirely? And I think it has to do with the fact that sin in the post-flood world continues. The flood fixed the outside, but it did not affect what was happening on the inside. A, A subsequent work of grace through the Messiah, something that we celebrated this morning in the new com- uh, the new covenant at the communion table, something is necessary beyond just the flood. In other words, you can fix people on the outside all you want. You can give them a, a shave and give them a shower and tell them to wash their hair and put them in a fresh set of clothes. You can even give them an education. You could help them with certain work ethic habits, but it's still the same old sinner, unless the Holy Spirit and the new nature has taken residence in a person. The sin nature is still obviously continuing. The flood didn't fix everything. In fact, we were warned of that back in Genesis 8 and verse 21, where it says post-flood, The Lord smelled the smoothing aroma, and the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man. Now watch this. For the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. I will never again destroy everything as I have done. The flood fixed a lot of problems, but it didn't fix man's nature. It didn't fix man's heart. And so the promise of a coming Messiah to fix the inside of a person continues on by way of necessity. And you would have thought, reading the account here in the book of Genesis, that Noah's obedience was so exemplary. 
I mean, virtually everything that Noah has done has been honoring to God, and God has used Noah strategically to move humanity from pre-flood world to post-flood world. He preached, and he built the ark, and he did exactly what God said, and everything in Noah's life has been executed so flawlessly as we read this that you might even think that he's the Messiah, In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, it says this, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. We know that this Messiah is coming. We know that this Messiah is on the horizon. And you might look at Noah's life and say, he's got to be the Messiah. And so this story, I think, is inserted to show us that he is not the Messiah. No mere human being, as obedient as they are and as consecrated to the things of God as was Noah, can qualify. There has to be someone special coming who was untainted by this sin nature. The God-man. And so this sort of story causes us to look forward, to not idolize Noah, to show that he had the same human weaknesses that other people, that the rest of us have, and there must be someone else on the horizon. Noah was the best of the best, but the truth of the matter is he was still a person. Romans 3 verse 23 says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Would that not include Noah? And this becomes the problem of the Christian taking a servant of God and putting them on too high of a pedestal. I've noticed Christians doing this ever since I got saved. I've noticed that I've done it at times. Someone is a blessing to your life and you act like they're Jesus themselves. And what's tragic about putting people on too high of a pedestal is eventually they're going to let you down. Sugarland Bible Church will let you down. I mean, we try hard to do things correctly around here, but we eventually will do something to let you down. The elder board here will let you down. The, uh, myself, I, I will let you down. And why is that? Because of something called sin that we're born with. And Jesus came into the world to fix us from the inside out, all of us including Noah himself. And another thing that comes to my mind as I try to figure out why Moses would include this story is the fact that it proves to me that this book must be from God. If man had written this book, then all of man's warts would be glossed over. They would be, to quote the modern vernacular, canceled, removed, edited, And yet the Bible doesn't read that way. It takes the warts of everybody except Jesus because he had no sin nature and just sort of discloses them for the whole world to see. And therefore, if a human being wrote this book, it wouldn't read the way that it reads. But the fact that it's so um, overt in discussing the failings of God's choicest of servants It must mean that this book comes from God to man. Noah was a saved sinner who still sinned. But he was saved. There's no doubt about that. Noah's name shows up, for example, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 7, which says, by faith... Being warned by God about things yet not seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household by which he condemned the world and and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. When God brings about the regeneration of all things and we are all with God for eternity, you'll, you'll see Noah there. Be some interesting conversations like, What were you thinking? But then Noah could ask you, looking at your life, what were you thinking? 
Well, let's change the subject. <laughs> Noah is a full participant in our eternity. But despite the fact that he was saved, he still had flaws, he still had warts. And this leads me to something I wanted to mention today. And that's why I've entitled this message, The Perseverance, excuse me, The Preservation of the Saints. There is a doctrine that's very dominant in Christianity today called the perseverance of the saints. It's taught primarily from two angles. Arminians who will say, if you don't persevere in good works till the end, to the end of your life, you lost your salvation. Or you have those from the reform camp following an aggressive doctrine of Calvinism explained through what this anacronym says, TULIP, the P standing for perseverance of the saints. What they say is, oh, we believe in eternal security. We believe in once saved, always saved. But if you don't persevere till the end of your life in good works, then you never had salvation on the front end. It's the same doctrine. Arminius, you lost your salvation. John Calvin, you never had salvation. And many, many people believe this doctrine. Here's a few quotes just to show you the dominance of this thinking in modern-day evangelicalism. Here's a Reformed theologian, John Murray. He says, the crucial test of faith is endurance till the end, abiding in Christ and continuance in the Word, exactly what Noah didn't do here. He cannot abandon himself to sin. He cannot come under the dominion of sin. He cannot be guilty of certain kinds of unfaithfulness. Let us appreciate the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints and recognize that we entertain the faith of our security in Christ only as we persevere in faith and holiness to the end. The perseverance of the saints reminds us forcefully that only those who persevere to the end are truly saints. Here's uh, Charles Hodge, famous Reformed theologian. In referring to the evidence of being one of the elect, he said, quote, The only evidence of election is effectual calling. And this is the production of holiness. And the only evidence of genuineness of this call and the certainty of our perseverance is patient continuance in well-doing. Uh, John MacArthur, here's one of the reasons that why we at Sugarland Bible Church agree with some of the things John MacArthur says. We're not a John MacArthur satellite campus by any stretch of the imagination. John MacArthur promotes these sorts of doctrines in his very popular ministry. He says, if a person fails to love and obey the Lord through the trials of life, then there is no evidence that he possesses saving faith. How many people do you know who came to church for a while, had a little trouble in their lives, and left? You know, if I can stop the quote there, um, I know a lot of people like that, like myself. There have been times in my life, my life where I've walked away from organized Christianity because of frustrations that I had. Now, it's hard for me to do that today because I get paid for being here. <laughs> As I like to say, I get paid to be good. Everyone else here is, can be good for nothing. Amen? <laughs> The quote goes on and it says, although they may have had a profession of faith in Christ, they cannot be identified as those who love him because their lives are not characterized by enduring obedience. John Piper says, no Christian can be sure that he is a true believer. Hence, there is an ongoing need to be dedicated to the Lord and to deny ourselves so that we might make it. 
A.W. Pink, a writer from a previous generation, very strong Calvinist. You see it there in his book, The Sovereignty of God. He says, readers, if there is reserve in your obedience, then you're on your way to hell. Because you're not one of the elect. You're not persevering till the end. And it doesn't take much to rinse one's mind of this doctrine when you stop listening to people and start reading the Bible. Because I can show you in the Bible an awful lot of people that I spend ex- I plan on spending eternity with that did not finish well. They didn't finish in good works. Their their Christian life really didn't go out with with a note of, uh, you know, a a bang, an optimism, a pizzazz. They, They dropped the ball. One of them we're reading about right here. This is revealed very early in the Bible. It's Noah and his Drunkenness, another one is, is Lot. Are you a lot like Lot? Lot was a believer. You see that in Second Peter 2, verses 7 and 8, yet his lifestyle certainly didn't reflect it at all when you read Genesis 19. How about Moses himself, our author, the lawgiver? How exactly did his life end? Well, he struck the rock when he wasn't supposed to. And though he had faithfully led the Israelis, the Hebrews, through the wilderness, he himself was not allowed to enter Canaan. He could only see it from a distance from Mount Nebo. Moses' life didn't end on a high note. How about that whole generation that he was leading? Did their lives end on a high note? No. Nope. Most of them, except for their children, died there in the wilderness. Oh, well, they weren't saved. Really? Why is their name in the hall of faith? Hebrews 11, verse 29, if they're not saved. Oh, Moses was not saved. That's ridiculous. At the Mount of Transfiguration, who was with Jesus? Moses. How about Samson? Did his life end well? You know, I've been asked this question, is suicide the unpardonable sin? We're not advocating disobedience and we're not advocating suicide, but there's only one unpardonable sin. That's dying, having never, having never trusted in Christ. Look at what Samson did at the end of his life, how he pulled the pillars of the temple, causing the structure to fall down upon him. Look at his escapades with uh, Delilah. Look at all of the misery that he brought upon himself, yet there in Hebrews 11, verse 32, you'll see Samson's name mentioned as a member of the Hall of Faith. How about Saul? I've heard a lot of preachers just come out and say Saul wasn't saved. Look at all the things Saul did at the end of his life. And yet, what does 1 Samuel 28, verse 19 say as Samuel is speaking to Saul? From, the, from eternity, he said to him, tomorrow, you and your sons will be with me. Knowing full well that Saul's suicide was right around the corner. Is, is suicide the unpardonable sin? Apparently not. Not a good thing to do, obviously. How about Solomon? How did his life end? 1 Kings chapter 11 verse 4 says when Solomon was old his wives turned his heart away to follow other gods and his heart was not fully devoted to his Lord his God. In fact when you continue on in that chapter you'll see the anger of God against Solomon. His life did not end on a high note. It ended in disaster. Well, Solomon wasn't saved. Now we've got a big problem. Because if Solomon wasn't saved, you've got three books in your Bible that were written by an unbeliever. Proverbs written by an unbeliever. Ecclesiastes written by an unbeliever. Song of Solomon written by an unbeliever. Ridiculous. 
Solomon was clearly said, well, you know, Old Testament, that's just Old Testament stuff. You don't have anything in the New Testament, do you? You notice I've got seven there. Here we got ten. And I ran out of space. How about the untrustworthy believers in John 2, verses 23 through 25? What do you do with them? It says, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed as they observed the signs he was doing. In Greek, that's pastuo ace. It's the same formula used to describe any other saved person in John's gospel. But Jesus, on his part, would not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. He did not need anyone to testify about mankind, for he himself knew what was in man. Save people that Jesus didn't entrust himself to. They were believers, but not disciples. Yeah, but pastor, don't you have to do three things to make sure you're saved? Don't you have to admit you're a sinner? That's the A. Don't you have to believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? That's the B. And don't you have to make some sort of public proclamation? And if you don't do all three, you're not saved. There's a lot of parachurch ministries that I sort of locked horns with when I came here to Sugarland Bible Church. Because they were coming in and they wanted to teach that. And when you stand up and say that's not in the Bible, they kind of look at you like, well, who are you to challenge us? Don't you know we're an international parachurch ministry? Well, here's the truth of the matter, folks. As you go through the Bible, you don't find parachurch ministries. It's the church that has the authority, not the parachurch ministry. I'm not against parachurch ministries, but they are here to support and supplement what is taking place in the church. They are not here to control or to dominate the doctrine of a church. And somehow we've got the tail wagging the dog. The ABC method of salvation. What do you do with John 12 verse 42? Nevertheless, many, even of the rulers, believed in him. Pastuo ace. But because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing. So that they would not be excommunicated from the synagogue. They believed in Jesus, these people, yet they kept their mouths shut. Because they thought... And understood that if they were excommunicated from the synagogue, livelihoods disappear, families disappear, the synagogue is everything. So they stayed in fear. One of them is a guy named Nicodemus, who kept his mouth shut about the things of God. And you wouldn't even know he's a believer until towards the end of John's gospel. ABC method of salvation? You'd have to say John 12, verse 42, they're not saved. And yet, clearly, exegetically, linguistically, pastuo ace, they are all saved. You know, you get somebody in a Muslim country who hears the gospel and gets saved, and they don't say a word about it because they know if they say anything about Jesus or Yeshua, then their family could be killed or their daughter raped, and they keep their mouths shut, are you going to tell me that they're not going to heaven? What do you do with Ananias and Sapphira? Acts 5, verses 1 through 11, who were slain in the Holy Spirit, which, by the way, is not a good thing. Oh, they weren't saved. Really? It says in verse 11 of Acts 5, great fear came over the whole church. One of our own has been disciplined by God to the point of death. That caused fear in the church. A fear that probably wouldn't exist to the same level had they just been unbelievers. How about Simon the sorcerer? Acts 8 verse 13. It says he believed. It says Acts 8 verse 13. Now even Simon himself believed and yet he turned around the next step and he tried to buy the power of the Holy Spirit 
well, that's not a real faith that he had. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says he believed. How about the immature believers at Corinth? The carnal believers? The infants in Christ? Why would he call them in Christ if they're not saved? What about unrewarded believers at the judgment seat of Christ? People entering heaven, yet they can smell the smoke on their garments because their works have passed through a fire and they're unrewarded. Paul says they're saved, but unrewarded. How about people that are drunk and disorderly at the Lord's table? 1 Corinthians 11, verses 27 through 32, where Paul says, For this reason some of you are sick and some of you have fallen asleep, which is a polite way, a euphemism of saying death. Well, they weren't Christians. That's not what the Bible says. It says they were disobedient Christians. How about Demas? 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10, where Paul says, Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me. Oh, well, Demas was never saved. Really? Then why would Paul put Demas, Galatians 4, verse 14, into his ministry team? Why would Paul put a guy into his ministry team whose salvation was in jeopardy? That doesn't make any sense. How about Ephesians 5, verses 11 through 14, where it says, Concerning him we have much to say and is difficult to explain, since you have become poor listeners. For by this time some of you ought to be teachers. You have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God and you have come to need milk and not solid food. Immature believers in the book of Hebrews. Oh, they weren't Christians. Are you sure about that? Because the author of Hebrews says right there, for this time you ought to be teachers. Why would a biblical writer tell an unbeliever to teach a believer? That doesn't even make any sense. How about the seven churches in Asia Minor? You know, there's only two churches that Jesus has no criticism for. But to the rest of them, he criticizes all of them. Like Laodicea. Oh, well, they weren't Christians in Laodicea. Are you sure? Revelation 3 verse 19, Jesus says this to Laodicea, the worst of the lot the worst of the worst, to those whom I love and rebuke and discipline. You do not discipline the neighbor's kids. You discipline your own kids. The Laodiceans belong to Jesus, but they came under his disciplinary hand. Perseverance of the saints... Leaving one's life in good works or they're not a Christian? I'm wondering how we even came up with this idea. It's not in the Bible at all. Everybody that's saved is saved by grace. Unmerited favor. Which means the disobedient and the obedient are saved the exact same way. Why is that? Because of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13. If we, see how Paul puts himself in the position of the audience? If we are faithless, he remains what? Faithful, for he cannot deny himself. The reason you have in the Bible disobedient Christians that will die and go to heaven is because of this verse right here. It's grace. Unmerited favor. Now, don't get me wrong. Should you be a disobedient Christian? No, not a good idea. Should you seek to persevere to the end of your life in good works and go out on a positive note? Yeah, and there's a lot of examples of the Bible of people that did that. But it is not. It is not. It is not a salvation issue. 
And I understand that the majority of you listening to this are saying, I've never heard anything like this before. Because the dominant market share in evangelicalism is Arminianism and Calvinism. Around the clock, people are taught through the different models, perseverance of the saints. And I'm just asking you to do one simple thing. Don't listen to me. My opinion at the end of the day doesn't mean a lot. Read your Bible. I mean, does this doctrine really comport with what the Bible says? I don't think it comports at all. Because right here at the very beginning of the Bible, I know it doesn't seem like the beginning since this is like our 38th lesson. But right here at the beginning of the Bible, at least page-wise, not sermon-wise, you see the failure of a man who was used greatly by God, who you can fully expect to spend eternity. We do not teach at Sugarland Bible Church the perseverance of the saints. You know what we teach? We teach the preservation of the saints. That it is God that keeps us. We teach it right out of 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5, which says, To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Do you realize this? That as a child of God, you're on a fast track to glory. And there is an inheritance that you're going to receive once you get there that inflation can't corrode. The value of it can never deteriorate. And yet it's yours. Well, how do I know I'm going to get there? Well, brother, you better buckle down. Perseverance of the saints. You better buckle down or you're going to lose it. You better buckle down or you never had it. Round the clock. Taught this over and over again. What does Peter say? You're going to get it because you're protected by the power of God. That's how you're going to get it. When you believed in Christ, God made you promises that are part of the grace package. They're yours by way of grace and unmerited favor. And if you're in Christ, as I speak, you are being preserved. Well, pastor, you don't know the kind of week that I had last week. Doesn't matter. You're being protected and preserved by the power of God. God doesn't say to you, okay, you're saved, now keep working to keep it. If you have to keep working to keep it or prove you've had it, you're your own savior. Do you understand that? We don't preach doctrines here where we are our own savior. We preach Jesus as our savior. I got in to the door through unmerited favor. And it's the grace of God that keeps me in the door. Now, if I got in through good works, then I better mind my P's and Q's. But I never got in through good works. I got in through his good work. And the God that saves me by grace is the God that keeps me by his grace. Well, yeah, but what about 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27? Doesn't Paul talk about a prize? And doesn't he say in verse 27, I discipline my body and make it my slave so that I, after I have preached to others, I myself might be disqualified for the prize? What do you do with that? It's the proper definition of the prize. If you think the prize is salvation here, then Paul is contradicting everything he ever taught about salvation. In Romans, Ephesians, Galatians, because he always taught it was by grace. The prize is rewards above and beyond salvation. 
not salvation itself. It's rewards that we will receive or not receive above and beyond salvation. That's why you walk out discipleship. That's why you yield your body unto the Lord. You're not doing it because, oh no, the carpet is going to be ripped out from under me and I'm going to go to hell. That's not biblical thinking. The carpet can never be ripped out from under you because you're standing on that carpet not by your own merits. You should submit to the Lord, yield to him because you want to enter heaven fully uh, rewarded. It's interesting how Sunday school today with partial rapturism fit very well with Genesis chapter 9 verse 21 which describes Noah's failures of a saved person. So Ed Jones, that's why we stopped at verse 21. And so when are we going to do verse 22? We're going to do that next week. We have Noah's sin, verses 18 through 21, a long excursus into the perseverance of the saints and why it's a wrong doctrine. And then we'll see Noah's son, Ham, And his sin against Noah, putting his fourth son, Ham's fourth son, under a curse, not the black race. And then we'll see Noah's death. And then God will move us into the next phase of the book of Genesis, which is Genesis 10 and 11. If you're here today and you don't know Christ personally, our invitation is God's invitation. Jesus says, come unto me all you are weary and I will give you rest. You've been laboring so long under Phariseeism and religiosity that Jesus offers rest. And that was accomplished through his shed blood and bodily resurrection 2,000 years ago, which is by grace for us. We receive it by faith and we're brought into the full-orbed grace package. If it's something that the Holy Spirit is convicting people of, of their need to, to do this, our exhortation is to respond to that ministry of the Holy Spirit and trust in Christ and Christ alone for salvation, reversing completely your eternal destiny. And Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6 says, He who began a good work in you will do what? Will complete it. The final phases of your salvation will be executed as well. Because that's part of the grace package as well. So our exhortation is for people to receive that even as I'm talking by way of faith. Which means placing your confidence in what Jesus did for you. If something you need more explanation on, I'm available after the service to talk. Shall we pray? Father, we're grateful for your grace, your truth, your word, how it comes to us, and help us to cleanse our minds of a religious, pharisaical spirit and just enjoy this week serving you in the grace that you have provided. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said.